dari Nepal, Dilganga Institute of Homology, dan kepada para spesialis mata yang hadir eh, pada webinar pagi ini, dan juga kepada para residen dan dokter muda yang saya hormati. Eh, pagi ini eh, kita ada tiga topik, eh, yang pertama dan tiga pembicara, yang pertama adalah eh, Profesor Dr. Suharjo, spesialis mata konsultan dengan judul prevalensi ulkus kornea di RSUP Dr. Sarjito. Yang kedua adalah Lina Baj Rajya Mem, keratoplasti sarjiris in Nepal, and uh, Mrs. Anumunandar, MD, uh, with the pattern of uveitis in Nepal. Uh, kita juga menyapa juga pada peserta-peserta webinar yang sudah join di luar UGM. Mungkin nanti bisa akan sesi tanya jawab uh, pada akhir presentasi. Mungkin yang pertama, uh, Profesor Dr. Suharjo, spesialis mata konsultan, untuk mengisi topik kami waktu dan tempat kami persilahkan. Selamat pagi. Ya, selamat pagi. Uh, good morning, Dr. Anu <laughs> and Dr. Lena, Corona Specialist and UVT Specialist <laughs> from Pilkanga Institute of Tamologi. Ya, eh, selamat pagi, teman-teman, para residen, uh, para co-assistant, uh, we have a student from undergraduate, <laughs> uh, para teman sejawat, Eh, pagi ini saya sebagai tuan rumah ya sekedar mengintroduksi eh, kuliah sebenarnya ini asalnya kuliah kami guest speaker special for you <laughs> but I will to give uh, uh, little information in uh, my hospital so I think it's very important in two word because we have some problem Uh, especially in corneal problem, uh, especially in corneal donor. <laughs> Jadi <coughs> saya menjelaskan ini masalah ulkus kornea yang terus terang ini sebagai penyebab kebutaan uh, di, in, di Yogyakarta dan Indonesia seperti halnya di Indonesia dan negara sedang berkembang. Uh, jadi ini termasuk beban uh, kita sebagai penyebab kebutuhan kornea. Slide berikutnya. Ya. Jadi sebagai pengantar ya pada umumnya karena penyakitnya kornea di Indonesia lebih banyak karena infeksi ya, terutama mikrobial infeksi yang terutama adalah bakteri, uh, jamur, virus dan parasit. Ya. Maybe is similar in, in Nepal, maybe, Dr. Lena, similar. Uh, yeah, the total data ini menunjukkan uh, cukup besar kasus-kasus mikrobial keratitis. Tapi yang penting adalah memang negara-negara tropis itu 10 kali dibandingkan negara-negara yang non-tropis. Oleh karena itu, Uh, kita uh, menyebutnya sebagai silent epidemic, jadi uh, wabah yang barangkali uh, ya, uh, ya anulah, tidak kentara, tapi sebenarnya jumlahnya cukup besar. Uh, slide berikutnya. Ya. Nah, ini kita data-data di uh, pada umumnya. Uh, saya kira mirip juga dengan negara-negara yang lain, terutama daerah tropis terutama adalah Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Staphylococcus pneumonia, Pseudomonia dan Enterobacter. Kemudian yang tidak 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 umum itu Neisseria, Moraxella, Mycobacteria dan Nocardia. Sebentar kalau kita lihat dari spektrumnya itu kan mirip dengan flora normal. Jadi kita lalu berpikir sebetulnya penyebabnya tidak jauh-jauh amat sih. 
mereka kalau saya mengatakan pada pasien itu ya konjungtif atau fone kita itu adalah kebun binatang jadi manakala ada trauma di situ ada binatang-binatang liar di situ ya termasuk stapelokokus auris yang paling banyak dan epidermidis itu tentu yang pertama kali masuk di situ adalah ya bakteri-bakteri tersebut ya uh, sehingga uh, inilah yang perlu diwaspadai nah tentu saja nanti kalau kita ingin membuktikan penyebab yang pasti ya mestinya mirip-mirip itu ya nah, kemudian ada yang tidak sering ini ya uh, itu. Uh, tapi yang baru-baru ini ada juga yang mikrosporidi itu juga baru dan aneh menurut saya uh, tapi itu relatif jarang dan uh, manajemen juga paling sulit saya berikutnya ya nah kita berbicara penyebabnya apa penyebab infeksi tapi tentu eh, harus ada yang memicu ya yang paling banyak adalah trauma trauma ya maybe like in Geneva ya yeah. because ini uh, agraris agraris so many uh, farmer etc yeah. jadi trauma karena kita negara agraris orang pedesaan ya yeah. Ya, tidak lepas juga resikonya bekerja itu e, dan mereka juga kurang edukatif ya kita semua tahu bahwa negara Indonesia itu sangat berparasi dari negara penduduk yang non edukatif miskin ya e, kemudian juga kalau kita melihat dari pasca kesehatan orang kena trauma tidak langsung berhadapan dengan dokter mata tapi mereka kadang-kadang berhadapan dengan e, tenaga kesehatan yang menurut saya tidak kompeten, ya, jadi memberikan terapi yang tidak tepat. Akhirnya terjadi e, kelainan yang e, berat dan mengancam e, kebutaan. Gitu. E, nah ini yang kebanyakan polanya yang ini para tenaga-tenaga e, ini petani itu. Ya. Kemudian yang kedua kontak lens use, ya. pengguna kontak lens. Ini menurut saya ya karena faktor edukasi yang kurang. Jadi para remaja-remaja itu menggunakan kontak lens terutama untuk kosmetik. Jadi supaya warna irisnya sesuai dengan keinginan apa itu. Bajunya hitam mungkin pakai kontak lens hitam. Ada enggak kontak lens hitam Dokter ini? Enggak ada ya. Oh, gelap. Tapi intinya bahwa itu kosmetik. Jadi dan mereka e, melupakan atau tidak tahu kaidah-kaidah yang digunakan kontak lens. Jadi Kontak lens itu kan menimbulkan lapar oksigen. Orang lapar kira-kira mudah infeksi enggak? Mudah infeksi kan? Uh, karena metabolisnya banyak anaerob. Ya, kemudian produksi ATP berkurang dan sebagainya. Lalu mudah infeksi. Nah itu, ini ada faktor edukasi. Ya. Uh, saya ingatkan aja nanti, terutama para koas ini, <laughs> jangan pakai kontak lens lebih dari 6 jam ya. Uh, itu itu menimbulkan lapar oksigen, lapar oksigen ya jadi udim. Udim lalu mudah infeksi. Uh, kemudian penyakit uh, ocular surface disease uh, itu uh, ini terkait dengan dry eye misalnya. Orang-orang tua uh, kemudian uh, yang paling bawah itu sistem imun yang terganggu. Ya, kemudian kadang-kadang ini kaitan dengan operasi palubra kemudian HIV infeksi yang mulai meningkat. Uh, in Nepal, uh, many cases with HIV Human immunity, eh? many, many cases are rising, like in Indonesia. The next slide. Nah, ini sebagai pembanding saja data dari Taiwan. Taiwan yang mirip Indonesia, ya, ya negara kecil, tapi juga ya, ya masih menurut saya ya sekarang lebih tinggi sedikit, ya. Tapi intinya bahwa saya ingin menunjukkan kebanyakan oleh karena bakteri, ya. Nah, gitu nah. ya slide berikutnya nah ini yang disadar sendiri ya dalam uh, tahun 2015 maaf ya datanya agak terlambat tapi yang penting kita mencerminkan bahwa kondisi di saat itu sebagai pas ke tiga kayak apa ya karena tujuh sembilan kasus uh, ternyata 53 persen itu adalah uh, bakteri ya The, the most causes is bacteria. Maybe like in Nepal, maybe 
the worst case is how the evicted what kind is punjai or of the corneal ulcers are uh, culture positive uh, and 55 is uh, no growth in culture mm -hmm. and of those, what, what kind is bacteria or fungi of those are culture positive around uh, same 50 percent grow oh, fungus yeah, yeah, 50 percent yeah. grow uh, bacteria okay thank you okay jadi ini kira-kira seperti ini uh, kemudian yang penting lagi adalah ini untuk teman-teman nanti uh, di pas kedua dokter mata Kira-kira lalu kalau bakteri seperti itu, kira-kira kalau di paskes di komunitas paskes dua, kira-kira apa yang pilihan utama? Ya, ini menurutkan sensitivitas kita memilih amikasin. Jadi kalau mengenai dokter Popi, nanti kita ada pes lainnya itu saja ya. Dulu kita, dulu sampai sekarang kita kadang-kadang masih pakai sertasi dim, tapi kita ada diingatkan dari komite infeksi saat itu, apa lo bukan sertasi dim lo, amikasin ya, supaya tidak anu. Cuma amikasin tidak tersedia dalam bentuk tetes, tapi harus harus dibuat dalam tadi apa injeksi. Ya, kalau dasar 50 mg per cc. Cuma harus disimpan di dalam es supaya tahan dua minggu. Ya, jadi mungkin seperti dokter Popi menerima dari anu ya general practitioner nanti ke dokter Popi eh, langsung aja diberi seperti ini. Pilihan pertama nakala kita belum tahu uh, agent penyebabnya kan kita tidak mungkin toh memberi pengobatan ah tunggu lah tunggu kulturnya nah, nanti selak korporasi ya slide berikutnya ya ya ini tahun 17 ya tidak jauh berbeda just in my hospital the majority is still bacteria uh, and the second is punjal but the difficulty of uh, identification of the agent is Maybe some cases with fungal is not uh, detection. Yeah, as we know in the literature mentioned about only 60% uh, fungal inspection can detect by uh, apa? Uh, by uh, culture. And uh, we have uh, 29% kulturnya negatif. Yeah. Ini tantangan bagi kita, saya bukan mengkritik mikrobiologi ataupun patologi klinik, tapi faktanya adalah demikian. Jadi biasa kesalahan yang pengambilnya atau juga petugasnya. Nanti kita kita harus otokritik kepada uh, kita sendiri dan teman-teman kita sendiri. Sehingga itu menyulitkan kita dalam memanage secara tepat. Slide berikutnya. Ya, yeah. the next. ya. Yeah. Oh, conclusion. Terus, terus. Yang tadi. Nah, uh, kita lanjut. Kita ingin lihat profil sebetulnya uh, uh, kondisi akhirnya kan infeksi kornea itu menimbulkan kekeruan is like uh, the opacity of cornea still need about uh, transplantation cornea like uh, Dr. Lena <laughs> uh, to to keratoplastik. Uh, uh, jadi di Yogyakarta ini. Uh, di, ini laporan dari Bank Mata Yogyakarta. Kita punya dua rumah sakit di Sarjito dan rumah sakit Jab. Uh, kita melihat ada berapa nih? Dua, 28 pasien kratoplastik. Uh, kebanyakan adalah uh, pasca infeksi kornea. Just the majority is uh, caused by infection and to make uh, opacity of the cornea. And then need uh, penetrating kratoplastik is about 47 percent infection and the second is iatrogenic yeah that is like uh, after cataract surgery and to make a fullus uh, kratopathy uh, and then hereditary is like a um, dystrophy cornea and then uh, scrap failure yeah. Ya ini kalau kita bandingkan dengan negara baju sangat berbeda. Di negara baju kebanyakan ada na hereditary ya. Itu kalau kita dilihat di literatur. Kita yang bulu dan yang yang banyak juga di negara baju adalah ini terkait dengan iatrogenik. 
saya tidak menyalahkan dokternya, tapi faktanya memang demikian. Yang datang ke kita adalah edema cornea persisten yang akhirnya eh, bahkan menjadi painful dan membutuhkan keratoplastik. Slide berikutnya. Nah, nah ini yang sampai 2019 ya eh, kita melakukan 14 pasien ya, ya. ini yang yang banyak malah ya tuh gini gini ya, banyak pasien-pasien yang habis operasi katarak biasa ya, katarak masal juga <laughs> saya tidak perlu menyebut ya, hasil operasi katarak saya sendiri juga <laughs> ada beberapa yang dikomunikasi endotil Uh, ya saya kalau saya melihat hampir semua seniornya pernah mengalami tapi dan ini tren dunia tidak hanya saya tidak menyimpul bahwa kita dokternya bodoh bukan begitu uh, Pak Oliva kenal dua tahun lalu juga menyebutkan ya di Amerika juga begitu bahwa uh, di komersi Indonesia mengalami momok dari operasi katarak di sana apalagi era uh, pakai emulsifikasi tapi in dokter Lena in 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 apa How about the uh, edema cornea persistent? Have many cases uh, after cataract surgery? Have you many cases about edema cornea persistent? About 9% of keratoplasty for post-operative coronal edema. 9% of all the keratoplasties. And you do penetrating keratoplasty or maybe Lamellar, like DSEC and DMEC, maybe? Uh, for complicated um, complicated bullous keratopathy, after cataract surgery, we do uh, PK, keratopathy. But for um, those who had a, a nice uh, anterior chamber and no vitreous loss, in those cases, we do laminar keratopathy. But those yeah. with aphekia and yeah. vitreous, so yeah, in yeah, yeah. this we do. Yeah, yeah. Di sana, mati mayoritas, penetrating keratoplastic. Ya, yeah. uh, if uh, you you meet about the MIP still edema cornea persistent, MIP uh, a bit, uh, uh, not not bullous keratopathy, but still edema cornea persistent. You do laminar keratoplastic or penetrating? Uh, sorry, I question. If if you have case with the uh, edema cornea MIP. Uh, two months after cataract surgery, you you meet uh, edema cornea persistent, edema cornea. You uh, direct to penetrating or you to uh, dissect at laminar keratoplastic? Uh, uh, post operatively, I I wait for three to four months because uh, some uh, what, some uh, coronal edema uh, uh, they clear even after three months. Mm. So I wait uh, till three months. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, after that, once the uh, post-operative inflammation is already gone, mm -hmm. eye is quiet, uh, mm -hmm. then I assess. And I prefer to do laminar keratoplasty, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Nah, ini Dr. Reni, nanti bulan apa? <laughs> Dr. Reni, maybe next year we'll, we'll go to <laughs> and study yeah, about yeah, yeah. laminar we, we, we have received our application. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Baik. Berikutnya. Ya, ya ini kita simpulkan bahwa eh, kebanyakan eh, problem kornea adalah infeksi karena bakteri. Kemudian eh, sekali lagi saya menekankan bahwa bulkus kornea itu merupakan keadaan darurat karena dia mengancam menimbulkan melting, desmetokel dan perforasi. Kalau sudah demikian itu penanganannya lebih sulit. Karena membutuhkan donor, ya, membutuhkan donor kornea yang kita sangat terbatas. Dan thank you buat Dr. Lena buat collaboration. We receive uh, some cornea donor from uh, Nepal, uh, Ibeng. <laughs> uh, kemudian uh, tentu saja kita faktor-faktor risiko itu harus dijauhi. Yang nomor satu adalah edukasi kepada tenaga kesehatan pas ke satu maupun dua. Jadi kalau menghadapi resiko-resiko trauma itu cepat-cepat harus mendapatkan treatment yang tepat dengan dan pengalaman kita, komplain dari para pasien ini juga sangat 
sangat mengkhawatirkan. Jadi misalnya pemberian antibiotik yang frekan misalnya harus tiap jam, ya diberikan tiap jam. Kadang-kadang mereka ya tiga kali sekali saya kira kita harus meng, uh, uh, memahami minimal dosis uh, kadar minim, jadi MIC-nya tidak dicapai sehingga terjadi infeksi. Oleh karena itu saya mengatakan dosisnya harus frekuen, uh, uh, teratur, kemudian ya diawasi juga mungkin tiga hari sekali sehingga mereka tidak menjadi lebih parah. Barangkali itu sudah uh, selesai ya. Ya, terima kasih. Tapi ada pertanyaan dari para hadirin yang di sini. Terima kasih Prof. Suharjo atas uh, kuliahnya. Uh, mungkin pertanyaan uh, dan tanya jawab setelah tiga-tiganya selesai, nanti dikumpulkan jadi satu. Uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Lina Bajrakarya with the topic about uh, keratoplasty surgeries in Nepal. Thank you, thank you, Professor Suazu, for inviting us for the guest lecture and for the symposium. I'm going to talk about an overview of keratoplasty surgery and then indications of keratoplasty in Nepal. So first of all, I'd like to talk briefly about the history of keratoplasty, which is uh, quite interesting. Before 1800, it was considered a, as dark area of corneal blindness. There was no treatment for corneal transplantation. And in the next uh, next century, uh, Von Hippel, the surgeon, he tried different types of types of keratoplasty. He transplanted uh, cornea from animal to animal, animal to human. And he also did various types of laminar surgeries, but with uh, with partial success. And only it is, and only in only in uh, in 1906, uh, surgeon Edward John did first keratoplasty surgery. Uh, which was which was with success. He transplanted human to human. He did human to human corneal transplantation. And after that, uh, from 1945 to uh, 1995, it was considered as golden age of uh, penetrating keratoplasty. During during this time, the first uh, eye bank was established in the in the UK in the in uh, New York in the United States. And after that, uh, then in since then after in 1995 till date. This, there was development of laminar keratoplasty, anterior laminar keratoplasty, and posterior, uh, posterior laminar keratoplasty. So uh, now coming to the different corneal diseases which need corneal transplantation, the indications for corneal transplantation are divided into uh, roughly into four categories: optical, tectonic, therapeutic, and cosmetic. Sometimes we all have to do cosmetic also, although patient cannot uh, don't have vision. So I'm going to the pictures directly. So these are, these are the optical indications for keratoplasty. This is the, this is the case of corneal dystrophy in which the stroma uh, stroma has the deposits, granular deposits. This is the case of corneal scar after infection. This one is uh, congenital corneal edema, congenital hereditary dystrophy. This one is the uh, spheroidal degeneration, and this is bullous keratopathy after cataract surgery. So these all eyes uh, need keratoplasty to improve the vision. So this is called uh, this is optical optical indication. So this is the therapeutic indication. This is a very bad fungal ulcer, non-healing ulcer. This is the bacterial ulcer which is resistant to antibiotics. These both are non-healing. So this uh, this uh, need corneal transplantation to remove the disease and to save the eyeball. And this is painful 
bullous cardiopathy after cataract surgery. This also needs colon transplantation for pain, for pain as well as vision. Okay. And this is the tectonic indication in which the cornea is very thin. This is a keratoconus, very thin cornea. This is the keratoglobus. Whole cornea is thin and is bulging. It is spherical. This is cone shaped. Keratoconus is a cone shape. This is perforated bacterial ulcer. This is perforated fungal ulcer. This is a very thin uh, ulcer, murinous ulcer, which is because of autoimmune condition. So these all need corneal transplantation to make the eyeball strong. And there is overlap of the purpose. For example, this too is also known as also therapeutic purpose. It will make the eyeball strong as well as remove the corneal disease. And this keratoconus and keratoglobus, they, they improve the vision as well as make the eyeball strong. So there is an overlap of the indication, okay? Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, different types of corneal uh, graft. Uh, this is the full thickness corneal graft or penetrating keratoplasty in which whole uh, cornea is removed and replaced by a donor. Uh, when the pathology, this, this is indicated when the pathology is involving whole cornea like infected keratitis, full thickness corneal scars, as Professor Suarzo said, and the adrenal leukoma is common uh, indication for corneal transplantation here. And for perforation, for vascularized scar, we have to do full thickness. And, uh, it, uh, and it can, some of the drawbacks of the, uh, of the PK or penetrating keratoplasty is that it can cause damage to ocular surface, iris, extrusion of lens, vitreous, increased chance of endothelmitis, cystoid macular edema, uh, long visual rehabilitation time, post-operative wound leak, and suture-related complications increase chance of rejection. So that is why, uh, that is why there is development of uh, lamellar keratoplasty. Okay, so lamellar keratoplasty. So uh, only the disease part is removed. This is the anterior lamellar keratoplasty in which the problem is in the stroma. So uh, the stromal portion is removed and replaced by the donor tissue. The endothelium is intact. There are two types of lamellar keratoplasty: anterior lamellar keratoplasty. One is this is called a maximum depth anterior keratoplasty in which dissection is done from the sclera like this with the spatula and, and the anterior portion is removed and replaced. And another type of anterior lamellar keratoplasty is deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which is done by big bubble technique. We inject air, the air will form a cleavage plane between the endothelium and the stroma, and we find that plane and dissect all the stroma. So in Tilganga, we mostly do this big bubble technique, uh, technique deep anterior keratoplasty for keratoconus and corneal dystrophies. So the benefit of this, so this is the um, this is the keratoconus, keratoconus of a patient in in our clinic, and he under and he underwent deep anterior keratoplasty. Endothelium is intact. He had sutures. So it is yeah, uh, it is indicated for superficial scars, squamal dystrophies, thinning because of murine ulcer and sometimes for squamous cell carcinoma, keratoconus, sterosium. We do antilamellar keratoplasty. This is an example of antilamellar keratoplasty. This is the dystrophy, this is post-operative. And so the advantage of antilamellar keratoplasty, no, no rejection of the endothelium, but the disadvantage is it can, during surgery, it can perforate. It can perforate and we have to do uh, PK. That is one um, difficulty during the surgery, and uh, and it also it, it can also have uh, suture-related complications like PK, you know, because it has got sutures and sutures can be loose. That is uh, the disadvantage. Another is the third type is posterior lamellar keratoplasty in which the endothelium, the disease is in the endothelium, the abnormality is is in the endothelium. We remove the endothelium and replace with the endothelium and uh, endothelium of the donor. So again, this is of two types. One is DSEC and one is DMEG. In DMEG, we remove only the only the endothelium. It is very thin and it is almost invisible. We have to stain with the uh, dye. Okay, so only the uh, dismiss membrane is replaced. And here, it, it, it this includes a little bit of stroma also. This is technically a bit easy to do the surgery. This one is a bit technically, there's a uh, uh, learning curve is high. So it is done in bullous keratopathy. Uh, here in Indonesia, I think that there's in one of the indication is bullous keratopathy for um, keratoplasty surgery. 
So this is how we do uh, posterior laminar keratoplasty. We put the cornea in the artificial anterior chamber. Then we do laminar laminar dissection of the donor, and we fold the donor and insert inside the uh, cornea. And there is no sutures in this uh, in the posterior laminar keratoplasty. Okay, this is how we do uh, in our hospital. So posterior laminar keratoplasty is it is stronger technically. Uh, there is no loose sutures, uh, no suture related problem. Less chance of endothelitis, uh, more uh, stable eye, faster visual recovery. So these are these all are the advantages of posterior laminar keratoplasty. So in any corneal transplantation, we have to do preoperative evaluation. It is same like cataract. I'm not going into detail, uh, but one thing we should do is we should evaluate and we should decide what type of surgery we want to follow, whether whether full thickness or partial thickness, anterior or posterior laminar. We have to assess it, and if there is corneal vascularization, sometimes we have to give subconjunctival avastin, bevacizumab. And this subconjunctival uh, bevacizumab map is uh, anti-VGF, anti-vasoinitial growth factor. It will retract the corneal vessels. And we also do, uh, we also have to do uh, such uh, in injection time to time to, uh, to make the prognosis better. Okay, subconjunctival avastin, we can do interoperatively or after surgery. Okay, and of course we have to do a B scan on the details. I'm not going into detail. All this is like just like a cataract. Okay, and and prognosis of keratoplasty and the keratoconus and corneal dystrophy they have excellent prognosis. They have almost uh, 90, 95 to 100 percent graph survival, graph clarity at five years. And category two is a very good prognosis. Blue scatopathy, affecty, corneal scars, they have around 80% uh, graph clarity at five years. And this one, infective keratitis, opacities in the periodic group, vascularized corneas, they have fair prognosis around uh, maybe uh, 50 to 60 percent graph clarity at five years in five years' time. And the poor prognosis is chemical injury, Stevenson Johnson syndrome, multiple graph failure, and they have very poor prognosis, and in sometimes if repeated graft or failure occurs in these conditions, we have to do creator processes surgery. Okay, and creator processes is a different surgery in which it is also known as um, we we uh, put a plastic type of uh, device, a plastic type of device in the cornea and implant. That is different than uh, patent keratoplasty and other keratoplasties. So. In the postoperative complications, I like to talk about graft rejection. This is the rejection of the stroma. We can see the infiltrates. This is a picture of the endothelial rejection. We can see very dense uh, keratic precipitates and severe corneal edema. So this is the main fear after any any uh, patient keratoplasty. Uh, it, it can occur in uh, full thickness and uh, in uh, posterior laminar keratoplasty, but in anterior laminar keratoplasty, this doesn't occur. This, does, this cannot occur because patients has own endothelium. So some pictures of pre-op and post-op keratoplasty. This is pre-op and post-op, which was done in Tilganga. So this is very bad fungal ulcer, pre-op and post-op. This is a Murens ulcer uh, with a very, uh, very thin, and this is after um, the therapeutic graft, pass graft. This is perforated um, ulcer, which is post-op, uh, three months. And this is also after one year of uh, therapeutic corneal transplantation. This is also one big perforation, and this is after um, transplantation. We have done patch graft. This is a failed uh, therapeutic graft. Okay, so we did therapeutic graft, and on the top of that, again, infection occurred, and this the graft failed. So we have to do repeat graft in this case later on. This is also failed graft due to rejection. Okay, this is very large sclerocorneal graft here. It is cornea as well as sclera is transplanted because the ulcer was very huge. It was quite a long, uh, difficult type of surgery, including we have to take out the some portion of sclera also, limbus. So I'm going to briefly about the indications of keratoplasty in Nepal in a series of 645 eyes. Uh, 645 eyes is published in Nepal Nepalese Medical Journal in 2013. So this is a retrospective uh, case series. We collected uh, 645 number of uh, 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 keratoplasties between 2006 to 2010. And uh, number of patients were 559. 
and uh, male female ratio male is 64% female is 36% and in india and china also the same ratio male are more than female but in uk it is uh, almost similar ratio is almost similar this could be because male work outside they work as in the uh, in physical labor or other and they are more prone to trauma probably and this is because um, that is why male have more uh, infection in the cornea that could be one reason and another is because of the male uh, predominant society male people are more privileged for health services that could also be another possibility so this is the age distribution of our patients in tilganga so this is the this maximum is in uh, in, in 20 decade so average is is uh, 41 for 41 years which is similar to india and china in india and china also the same age group 41 years is the 41 to 50 was the average but in UK and USA, it is more than 50. 54 to 63 is the average year of patients undergoing plastic surgery. So, and I have divided age group into three groups, uh, 15 uh, children, um, uh, working age group, and elderly age group. So, these are three um, different categories of age group. This is geographical distribution of patients coming from different parts of the of the country this is one dot means one patient so this is the Kathmandu valley here uh, here this is the tor uh, and tilganga is located here it is the torsion tor referral center so, so uh, because uh, and many patients around this area and also from far area and uh, other 10 percent of foreign transplantation done in the for uh, foreign patient this is the vision pre-operative vision of patients undergoing keratoplasty most of them have a central corneal scar central pathology and only few have a peripheral disease most of them more 84 percent has vision less than 360 in this group so in uh, the uh, and 21 percent of the patients are bilateral blind those undergoing keratoplasty 21 percent as bilateral blind whereas 60 percent have good vision in the fellow eye or the eye so coming to indications we do uh, keratoplasty for infective keratitis which is 41 percent 45 percent of all patients have have gone for infective keratitis and out of this 41 60 percent are perforated corneal ulcer perforated and 40 percent non-healing and the most common organism is um, streptococcus pneumonia followed by aspergillus streptococcus in bacteria Cetococcus and uh, and uh, Staphylococcus and fungus, Aspergillus uh, and Fusarium infe in infection and corneal opacity 27 percent and out of this 27 percent, 50 percent are again because of heel infective keratitis and 50 percent from trauma. So, so, so taking all this together, almost 55 percent of all keratoplasty were were because of uh, infective cause active as well as uh, inactive so that is the uh, main uh, concern in our uh, nepal as well as in other developing countries so why the infection is so common no? so and the regraph is 11 percent uh, blue scatteropathy 9 percent uh, and in indonesia the commonest is opacity isn't it Op indonesia it is around 39 uh, percent is for opacity and second one is blue scatteropathy Okay, but here we have a fourth cause as uh, keratoplasty and keratoconus seven percent and dystrophy not much, but here I think dystrophy is more common, more common in uh, Indonesia. And uh, and others are minor like limboid dermoid, uh, vitamin A deficiency, ocular injury, and so on. So so this is again the same thing is shown in pie diagram showing the infective keratitis group very large. And 50% of this corneal scar also comes under infective. Okay, so a comparison of indications in India, China, and UK. So in UK, only 8% is for infective keratitis for therapeutic keratoplasty in developing country, only 8%. And in China and India, in China and India, again, infective keratitis and opacities are quite high. So this is the thing. Yeah? So bullous keratopathy is quite common in developing in developed countries, which is 40% la highest. So it is, and in Australia, keratoconus is the first indication in uh, in U Canada and UK. 
the graph is a commonest indication. So this is how the indications are different in different countries. And fixed dystrophy is quite common in Europe and America. It is quite quite commonly done. So these are the causes of coronary opacity. I have mentioned around 50 percent, about 50 percent is because of. So coming to causes of graph failure, we have uh, the, the reasons for graph failure is in 72 percent of cases, the gra graph failed because of uh, endothelial decompensation, like rejection from glaucoma, cataract decompensation, and uh, in 10, in 10, in 13 percent, graph failed because of again uh, secondary infection on the previous uh, graft. So this is bullous keratopathy. Most of them are because of cataract surgeries because we don't have uh, much of fixed dystrophy. And um, in our hospital, mostly we do uh, patent keratopathy because we have to deal with so much of infection. Uh, but nowadays we are also do we are also doing DALC and DSEC in, uh, in uh, wherever indicated and patch graft for peripheral ulcers. So this is the. Uh, types of surgery we do in the last in our last study. Most of them are uh, PK. So I also compare the uh, indications in different age group in children, in working age group, uh, in, in children, in working age group, in adults. And uh, it has been shown that uh, in all age group, uh, the infective keratitis is quite common. In children, it is the keratoconus. Keratoconus is more common in children. And bullous keratopathy, uh, obviously, more common in the older age group, whereas infective and opacity, it is uh, in it is present in all the age groups. So summary, uh, keratitis accounts for the colon transplantation in 55 percent of total uh, patients uh, patients in um, in Nepal. Uh, in India, this accounts for 34 to 48 percent. 25 percent of the patients are bilateral blind who under, undergo keratopathy. Majority of graft failure is because of endothelial failure. Uh, bullous keratopathy is quite commonly done surgery in age group more than 50 years. In children, keratoconus is common indication. So uh, summary is that we need effective coronary blindness prevention programs in Nepal and also in other developing countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Klaus. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for uh, the presentation. Uh, it's very important to us to know another knowledge and another uh, different types of epidemiologic outside in Yogyakarta. Okay. Uh, saya juga menyapa untuk para peserta webinar sudah terdapat enam yang mendaftar peserta. Uh, ini merupakan uh, webinar kerjasama dengan UGM dengan Tilgangga Institute of uh, TIO Tilgangga Institute of Ophthalmology uh, and the next speaker will be Dr. Anu Munandar uh, the topic is about pattern of uveitis in Nepal time is yours good morning everyone I'm so happy to be here along with Dr. Lina. Um, uh, and thank you for inviting Professor Soharzo. Uh, we had very good time uh, yesterday. We were very much taken care. We are uh, thank you for the hospitality you have given. Um, and uh, when I see all of you and all the residents here, uh, it reminds me of uh, our resident from Indonesia, uh, Dr. Henig Narula. Uh, she was uh, with us for three years and she finished uh, just last year and she came back to Indonesia. So she uh, she's always cheerful and I remember her face when I see all these residents now. Uh, so uh, here we see so many residents. We, ha we don't have so many. We have around 20, 22 um, all the time. So uh, uh, I I'm going to talk about uh, the pattern of uveitis in Nepal. So uveitis uh, is a topic which, uh, which is uh, very interesting and it is 
it is uh, it varies from one part of the world pattern varies from one part of the world to another part of the world and from one race to another race so it is it is very uh, unique uh, because the uh, you know the prevalence of infection can one kind of infection can be uh, more in one part of the world whereas the other part of the world might not have that infectious organism and then it's about the race also different kinds of genes which makes the difference uh, uh, that's why the pattern is different from one part of the world as to another part of the world for example if we talk about this bird shot retinopathy this is predominantly the disease of white people because of the genetic cause Whereas there are some other conditions like VKH, Volkswagen-Agiharda's disease, it is uh, it is the disease of uh, the race. So more pigmented people have that disease, whereas less pigmented people don't have. So uh, in in if we talk about the world scenario, uh, VKH is very common in Nepal, in Japan. Of course, Japan is uh, the uh, country where they have the highest number. And in South America, they also have it. This is Hispanic people we call, and um, maybe it's common here also. I'm not aware of it. Um, so it's about race. And if we talk about infection, if we see this picture, this is diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis. It is caused by this worm. So this worm might not be present everywhere in the world. Uh, the reports are from different parts of the USA and different parts of uh, 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 other European countries uh, and uh, also from Asia. So this is caused by uh, this worm. You can see this, it's crawling underneath the retina. So th this is uh, th this can be various kinds of worm, um, starting from toxocaracates, and uh, it could be raccoon worm, it could be the hook worm of dogs. So it can cause diffuse infection uh, in the retina and the optic nerve. And this is, ocular histoplasmosis so this is not present uh, although this is caused by fungus and um, th this is uh, present in certain part of the world only like it's present in different parts of the united states and different parts of uh, the european countries it's not found in this part of the world so the the, the thing is so uh, uh, it is so different so some part of the world has some kind of infection and another part of the world has another kind of infection due to the prevalence of the infectious, uh, difference in the prevalence of the infectious organism. And some conditions are ubiquitous. It's found everywhere, like toxoplasma retinitis caused by toxoplasma gondii. It's almost present everywhere in the world. And herpetic uveitis, this herpes virus, is everywhere in the world. And if you talk about HLA-B27 uveitis, although um, uh, the prevalence study hasn't been done in many parts of the world about the, this gene, presence of gene in uh, the individuals, uh, what I feel is uh, it's as pre prevalent as in the Western world. We recently did one study where we found uh, the high number of patients having HLA-B27 gene. So it, this uveitis is also very common, which causes acute anti-uveitis, unilateral, hypopion, or without hypopion. And syphilitic uveitis, again, you know, this uh, syphilis um, troponema pallidum, bacteria is everywhere. And uh, the, the incidence of syphilitic uveitis is rising because of uh, the world scenario where uh, the HIV infection is going up and then related infections are also uh, are in the rising. Uh, so. These, these are found everywhere in the world, it's quite common. Now, uniqueness of uh, uveitis and about treating uveitis is, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's only uh, one subspecialty in ophthalmology where clinician in one part of the world is not comfortable treating the patients from another part of the world because uh, if you stay in one part of the world, you are used to seeing patients in that uh, that area only, and then you are you uh, become aware of uh, you know different kinds of patterns of disease which prevalent there, and you are very comfortable treating them. You know how to treat. But then, if you get patients from another part of the world, if you or if you go to another part of the world and start treating different race and different uh, people, then you're not comfortable. That's why uh, we've seen. 
uh, that uh, even uh, very good centers in the world, uh, UVI centers in the world, they, you know, they are not able to diagnose the condition when they have to treat the people from outside. So this is, uh, uh, for example, recently we had one case, uh, uh, Nepali living in uh, abroad. So he, he had post pan uveitis and he was being seen in South Korea and he was uh, made diagnosis of toxoplasmosis and he was being treated, but then he was not getting better. And then he went to the USA also. He was seen by a very renowned doctor over there. Even from there, the treatment was not making much difference in the symptoms and he was having blurring of vision in unilateral eye. And then when uh, he came to us, th then we started uh, treating him and then surprisingly he got better. His vision was almost 636. And then after treatment over time, he regained vision up to 66 partial. And then it turned out to be a case of toxocariasis. So this tells us that, you know, it, the doctors are not, uh, you know, an inefficient, but then they are not aware of this toxocara in that part of the world. So they, don't, they are not able to make the diagnosis. And then another thing is uh, uveitis is basically clinical diagnosis. It's very difficult uh, to make a diagnosis based on the test. Although, you know, now in the developed countries, there are so many uh, advanced tests available, it, even, after, even with those, you know, the clinical diagnosis, uh, the weight of clinical diagnosis still high. So it's basically a clinical thing. And then another thing uh, commonly seen is if uh, um, Asian, if an Asian person is living abroad in the Western country, and if he or she develops uveitis, and if the particular diagnosis is not being able to made, then everyone thinks of tuberculosis. You know, it is a kind of prejudice thing or some something else. They think that anything that happens in eye is caused by the TB bacteria, okay? So the, this also, we've seen a lot. Patients have months and months of infection, uh, inflammation in the eye, and then they don't get better, and then they come to us, and then we finally find out that they are being treated as UV, uh, the tub tubercular uveitis. Then we, uh, when we look at the papers and we, when we look at the eye, then we find that there was no symptoms or signs really uh, con con you know, consistent with the tubercular uveitis. So this is another problem you know, many of the doctors are facing in the, in different, uh, the developed part of the world because they are not aware what it looks like, you know, tubercular uh, uveitis. That's why they don't know how to treat. Um, and if we talk about this part of the world, then we are not familiar with autoimmune disorders. We have very less experience. If we get birdshot choreotinopathy, then we would not be able to recognize because we, because we haven't seen much. Uh, although, no, although, and uh, we, uh, you know, we uh, sometimes get uh, foreigners uh, traveling and then they come to us with uveitis when they are traveling and then we have a little bit difficulty in diagnosing. And then, as we, I have already said, uh, diagnosis is basically clinical. And although the uveitis causes, uh, you know, uh, is responsible for three to seven percent of the blindness in total, um, which is, uh, you know, reported in various papers, uh, we feel that it's three to seven percent. It's not a big, big deal. But then we have to remember that. If it is cataract or if it is, um, you know, age-related macular degeneration, which hits the list uh, at the top, they, uh, these diseases occur in the old age or, you know, aging people. So they live blind for less a year. But if you talk, talk about uveitis, uveitis affects the young and the uh, adult people rather than children and, uh, you know, old age people. So if they become blind, they will live blind for a longer, longer years. So that that gives more impact on the society. So although it affects smaller population, it affects young adults, and the chronicity, the recurrence, and the complications they cause the less productivity in their life, and it will have very bad impact on on the so, uh, personality, and this will lead to psychosocial impact, social impact uh, is very high with UVI. This, although 
small appear number of people are affected. So we have to be very, uh, you know, um, aware of this thing. And, uh, you know, because of the fact that it contributes less on the blindness, if you uh, ask for grant um, for some UVID study, usually grants are rejected because they said that this is not public health issue. So this, uh, we feel a little bit bad that, you know, people are interested in public health issues only like diabetic retinopathy, ARMD. If you ask grant for these uh, researches, then you are immediately given grant. So this is, uh, uh, we have to make uh, people aware that, uh, you know, the, the blindness occurs in younger generation, younger people, not in old age. So we can see this. Seventy, so the age group, seventy to sixty years, which is the most active working group of our society, is eighty percent. Whereas children, eight percent, and above sixty-one years, it's twelve percent only. Now we can see how important UVIT, UVT blindness is. And uh, if we break down, we see that the age group twenty to twenty-nine are affected the most, almost one quarter, like 24% of all the, you know, UVAT patients uh, lie in this group, which is the most active group. Equal, sorry. But if we just, uh, you know, if we divide into different types of UVITIS, then surprisingly, post uveitis uh, is uh, more common in male, almost 61%. Uh, so males are uh, prone to develop post uveitis In terms of laterality and duration, uh, we are happy to see that the limited, limited disease is more than persistent, which is good. So it's uh, like uh, two thirds is limited and one third is persistent. In terms of unilateral, unilateral uh, laterality, again, it's good that more people have unilateral disease. At least, you know, if they become blind, maybe only one eye will become blind, not two, if even with good treatment, best treatment. And uh, ocular and systemic causes, if we, um, if, if we try to find out, it's uh, ocular is 31%, uh, the systemic is 12%, and still idiopathic is high. You know, we are not able to make diagnosis in a little bit more than 50% of cases. It's very difficult to make diagnosis in uveitis. And infectious and non-infectious, uh, infection is still, you know, a bit more than non-infectious condition. Again, idiopathic, we know it's high. And anat anatomical uh, uveitis, uh, uh, out of that, in anterior uveitis is very common. It, it, is, uh, it is, you know, the same in all parts of the world, I think. Anterior uveitis is more than, a little bit more than 50%, and rest is intermediate uveitis, and post uveitis, and pan uveitis. So, in terms of uh, uveitis in Nepal, anterior is the most common. And uh, pan comes at the second, third is intermediate uveitis, and then post uveitis. In, ter in terms of infectious uveitis, leprosy is still there in Nepal. Syphilis is also present, and there are few percents of post streptococcal infection. So, this is a uh, picture of a patient suffering from leprosy, and these are the rashes of syphilis. Okay. In terms of infectious ocular disease only, we talked about the infectious systemic disease. Now it's infectious ocular disease. Herpetic disease is more common, and then comes toxoplasmosis, then tuberculosis, and then Sharpu. We'll, I'll talk about Sharpu in a while. So this is a very typical toxoplasma retinitis. We all know, although the picture quality is not very good. This is tuberculoma, big tubercle, uh, big choroidal uh, lesion from tuberculosis. 
and this is of course herpetic uh, uveitis which has caused uh, it's not very visible here in uh, iris atrophy in, term, in terms of non infectious uh, systemic condition hla b27 disease is uh, the most common and then dkh is another common condition so the hypopion and uveitis with hla b27 and this is the bamboo spine which we see in the late stage of hla b27 and closing spondylitis and this is the swollen disc and then serous detachment of retina bilateral condition in vkh where we get a lot of systemic uh, findings like you know, skin changes foliosis madrosis and then you can see the vitiligo patches and in the later late uh, late present uh, presenters we find sunset glow fundus so this is the the slide showing non infectious systemic condition the commonest one is sarcoidosis where we get a lot of skin findings and some patients can have you no know, pulmonary symptoms and pulmonary symptoms might be might not be present even in the late uh, condition of the pulmonary disease and they will have uh, you know pan uveitis some might have just anti uveitis so this is sorry yeah so this is vasculitis and sarcoidosis known as candle wax stripping and bishets not all the not very common are found in nepal also and they cause you know severe vasculitis and optic neuropathy and they have this uh, oral ulcer and sarcoidosis i should say that it's uh, it's uh, usually under diagnosed and they all it is always confused with tuberculosis because they have very common features this is uh, that is you know granulomatous uh, hepes and then it could be pan uveitis they both can have retinitis choroiditis so it's always uh, you know under diagnosed so for uh, making the diagnosis of sarcoidosis again you know the history is very important although there are some diagnostic tests which might help us uh, towards diagnosis of sarcoidosis like you can Uh, have uh, you no know, ACE level angiotensin converting enzyme level you can take uh, check the mantu test that is you uh, skin test and usually it's negative if it is sarcoidosis and then clinically you can uh, you should try to find out the skin conditions because there are skin certain skin lesions which are very typical for sarcoidosis so it's again you know clinical diagnosis so it is quite common a non infectious ocular condition that means it's not associated with any other you know systemic condition in the body that's fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis it's quite common another one is, one is serpiginous choroidopathy so the top picture uh, it's not really visible there are small stellate kps present in this slide uh, which is uh, found in fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis and the bottom picture is of serpiginous choroidopathy there are you know choroidopathy changes here and here and if we talk about this serpiginous choroidopathy although it is uh, one of the conditions uh, listed in white dot syndrome which is basically non infectious condition what we see is in uh, nepal and you know neighboring countries it, it has some association with with tuberculosis when we see serpiginous choroidopathy we always try to find you know uh, try to see whether could it whether it has some connection with tuberculosis and many a times we find that uh, if you don't treat with tubercular anti tubercular medication they keep recurring they might become bilateral so uh, if the mantu test is positive if it is bilateral if it is recurrent then we always think of treating with ATT, and uh, surprisingly, we find a, a very good result after treating with ATT. They do not recur, so the, it has some connection with infection also somehow. And another condition is 
post the Sloshman syndrome, where the intraocular pressure goes acutely high with very minimally inflamed eye. And sympathetic ophthalmia, which occurs after penetrating trauma or uh, intraocular surgery, is also present. And lens induced, that is, you know, hypermature cataract can um, lead to uveitis if it is not treated on time. It's still there in uh, Nepal, although we've been fighting for cataract blindness and we have uh, been able to succeed a lot, but still, um, you know, small percentage of patients are still, you know, not getting the treatment on time because, uh, because of the you know, lack of healthcare facility. And so they develop uh, uveitis due to the um, hypermature cataract. We know that the posterior uveitis can be divided into retinitis, choroiditis, chororetinitis, and retinal vasculitis, uh, neuroretinitis. So in terms of posterior uveitis, toxoplasmosis is the most common one. I think it, it is true in various other parts of the world as well. And tubercular uveitis is, might be different in other parts of the world, but in Nepal, it's still prevalent. Toxocariasis, which I was talking about in the beginning, is also seen. Cysticercosis, again, is also quite common. You can see this lesion is very typical of toxocara um, choroiditis. And this is, of course, cysticercosis. And uh, in case of uh, posterior uveitis, we are able to find out the cause more frequently than other part of the UVI, it is a little less than half, you know, half uh, of the cases uh, are idiopathic, whereas more is, uh, in more of the cases, we, we know the diagnosis. In terms of pan uveitis, again, we will be talking about, uh, you know, Shapu, which is very common and unique to Nepal, toxoplasmosis, of course, BKH, and Focal herpetic retinitis. This is not a very common condition recognized everywhere in the world. But uh, if uh, if uh, you know, if I when I searched the world literature, we, I found very few reports. We know about acute retinal necrosis, which is very common everywhere. I mean, not common, but it's found everywhere in the world. But it is this focal herpetic retinitis is a bit different. That that be only one single you know retinitis patch and uh, it is usually in the posterior pole in or very close to the mid periphery of the retina and it is associated with the pan uveitis or just posterior uveitis and this is caused by herpes virus so this is less common but you know it is found in nepal and now if if we talk about shapu it is seasonal hyperacute pan uveitis the abbreviated, it is abbreviated as SHAPU. Uh, and it, it is uh, so far reported only uh, from Nepal. It affects children, basically. About, around 75% of uh, the patients are children and only 25% are adults. And what happens is that it's, it comes in a form of outbreak and they come with unilateral acute onset of pain, redness, photophobia, and usually uh, children are not able to say that uh, they have less vision in that eye. And it's uh, taken as conjunctivitis in many cases. And they, uh, by the time the diagnosis is made, it's already late because within two or three days, I become blind from, blind from severe infection, in, inflammation. And they present, most of them present with hypopion. The feature is very much consistent with you know, endophthalmitis, any kind of endo endophthalmitis. And then uh, in the uh, past, uh, nobody knew how to treat it. it. It was treated with various agents like uh, immunosuppressives, steroids, and everything. But uh, you know, it did not give good result. And later on, what we found out that when we give intravitreal injection of antibiotic, they recover dramatically if they come on time. That is within 24 to 48 hours. You know, they recover completely. They have. Uh, you know, they regain 6-6 six, six vision even if they had presented with hand move movement or count finger vision. So this is a, a, a mystery uh, yet because we, are, we haven't been able to 
you know, reach, the reach to the conclusion what actually causes. But we have done various studies which have shown very much a positive relationship with this moth. You can see this moth. This is called Gazelina moth. Um, we have done one epidemiological study which uh, shows uh, that, uh, you know, the children who are uh, who had come into contact with this moth have developed this condition. And um, not in all cases, but 10% of cases, we have found the, the follicles, hair follicles of those moth in different layers of cornea and even in the antechamber and the antivitreous phase. But it's only 10%. And many, you know, almost 50% of patients, more than 50% of guardians say that they had been playing with this moth because, you know, children are always attracted to insects uh, and these are so pretty and they like, uh, you know, touching them. And some naughty uh, children will, you know, kill the, you know, the moth with their hands or broom and then they will rub their eyes and then uh, the next day or so they develop this severe inflammation. And... Uh, um, in one of our studies, which is still not published, we found streptococcus pneumoniae very commonly inside the vitreous. It's almost like um, all total, the bacterial growth was nearly 40%, 40% and the predominance was of streptococcus pneumoniae and rest was uh, staph aureus. If it is adults, then staph aureus is grown more frequently. If it is children, then streptococcus pneumoniae. So we we still don't know how the moth and this bacteria is connected. There might be some connection, which we still have to find out, but then it is basically you no know, streptococcus pneumonia, uh, endophthalmitis. And we all know that whenever streptococcus gets inside the eye, the outcome is always very, very poor, no matter uh, whether it's uh, in, you know, uh, from uh, post-operative endophthalmitis or traumatic endophthalmitis, whenever, we have streptococcus uh, growing in the, uh, you know, from the vitreous. We know that the outcome is very, very poor. So it's not surprising that the Shapu children, when they come late, late means, uh, you know, three days later, then there's no chance of, you know, saving the eye. They become thysical. So this is very unique in Nepal. And intermediate uveitis, it's a bit uh, depressing because, you know, idiopathic is almost 95%. We are not able to find out the cause. And uh, out of known causes, pars planitis is um, common. Again, you know, pars planitis means it's a diagnosis of exclusion. When we don't find anything, we call it pars planitis. If it is bilateral snowball, snow banking in a um, young middle-aged people, a patient, then it's pars planitis. And sarcoidosis can also cause intermediate uveitis. In terms of anti-uveitis, herpetic, herpetic uveitis is more common. And, and the second is HLA-B27 disease. And pediatric uveitis, we just talked about Shapu, it's the most common one. And toxoplasmosis is the second one. You can see in one of our outbreaks a season, we had many, you know, many children at the same time Sometimes six children would come um, the same day with the acute onset of pain, redness. And these were three children who were being treated at the same time. They all had unilateral red eyes. And they will have hypopion uh, uveitis with a lot of fibrin. And uh, if they come a bit late, then this fibrin will cover the whole pupil. You won't be able to see the fundus at all. And uh, some children develop tricycle eye because of that. And uh, this, uh, this uh, is, uh, you know, taken from one of our uh, uh, publications, which was in uh, 2017. Thank you. I learned this from Terry Mahasi from Zena yesterday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Andrew Munader, for the presentation. It's very nice and very important to us. Uh, about uveitis, it, it's a very tricky and unique disease uh, that we must very careful and uh, very patient to get to the patient. And also, uh, there is awareness about uveitic blindness, and there's a 
but more popular than cornea or glaucoma blindness, but the euphatic blindness is important because they take uh, young adults age, that very productive age, uh, different from maybe diabetic retinopathy, it's an older age, but the euphatic blindness is they take young adults. So uh, is there any questions from the attendance here? In the, from the three topics, you can raise your hands, please. Okay, uh, Dr. Poppy, I'm yours. Can you do the mic? Terima kasih. Pertanyaan pertama buat eh, kepada Prof. Suarjo tentang antibiotik yang digunakan. Jadi di rumah sakit saya itu kadang-kadang cari amikasin juga sulit. Nah, tadi kita eh, Prof. bicara tentang amikasin, tapi di presentasi disebutkan bahwa amikasin dan primetroprim sulfametoxazole. Jadi kalau tidak ada amikasin, bagaimana cara menggunakan trimetoprim dan sulfametoxazole ini dengan benar? Apakah mungkin misalnya saya milih yang trimetoprim dan sulfametoxazole ini, Prof? Matur Kalau lihat apa dari PK atau mikrobiologi bahwa amikasin ini yang yang paling banyak sensitif. Eh, ya kalau persoalan ketidaksediaan, saya kira kok ya bisa itu bisa tersedia, dia bisa tersedia. Ya nanti <laughs> ya, di, diusulkan pada karena begini komisi farmasi kadang-kadang kalau tidak ada permintaan juga tidak 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 ya cuman selama ini kan saya makanya septasi dim kalau di Europe infeksi kan misalnya endoptamitis kita pakai adalah yang spektrum luar adalah septasi dim tapi ternyata ya memang ini juga kita harus mengkritisi juga sudah aja uh, di lab lab kita kok amikasin ini yang spektrum yang sensitif terhadap bakteri bakteri yang nah, kemudian masalah sulfa metoksasol itu memang terlibat sulfa dan dia agak sanksi itu yang uh, itu hanya dipakai oral padahal kita selalu berpikir kalau terlibat sulfa ini takutnya adalah reaksi hipersensitivitas saya ini tidak pernah menggunakan jujur aja hanya kadang-kadang pada kasus-kasus uh, toksoplasmosis tapi toksoplasmosis juga takut tapi toksoplasmosis juga uh, penggunaan uh, sulfa diasin buku-buku lama masih menyebutkan demikian tapi uh, sekarang ini untuk infeksi yang menggunakan obat batu kami, kami sudah menggunakan yang lain lebih aman terutama dari reaksi hipersensitivitas saya melihat kasus-kasus ya, Stephen Johnson itu bukan makin sedikit tapi makin banyak dan itu sangat uh, uh, menurut saya sangat berbahaya Aiman uh, Tunu, Dokter Lena, uh, 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 according the causal of infection, what kind do you choose about antibiotic? Piece of maybe uh, sensi sensitivity uh, in maybe in TEO. <laughs> what kind uh, do you use the, the mostly? Uh, the antibiotic it might be uh, uh, we not yet know about uh, the uh, maybe the the result of culture not yet uh, what can you use um, in our hospital the um, the commonest organism uh, is a gram positive almost um, uh, 90 percent are gram positive organism uh, streptococcus pneumonia followed by cephalococcus and cephalococcus oris and then uh, cephalococcus epidermidis three common organisms 
and uh, first step because because we have to think of uh, what are the commonest organisms so and uh, what, what time do you uh, i the most uh, i prefer uh, according to latest uh, sensitivity report uh, cefazolin cefazolin has the highest sensitivity against streptococcus and staphylococcus it has uh, almost uh, 92 percent sensitivity uh, for the gram negative organisms so i prefer to use Cefazolin and in combination, I um, cefazolin or amikacin, cefazolin amikacin combination, or uh, I use a single drug therapy of moxifloxacin, which is around uh, 85 to 90 percent sensitive against uh, gram positive organism. And if I if I know the um, uh, if I know the organism, uh, I give only that antibiotic. For example, if I know it is Streptococcus pneumonia, I give either cefazolin or moxifloxacin. But if I don't know the organism, if the culture is negative, uh, then I have to I have to think of um, broad spectrum antibiotics. So either so I have to combine cefazolin with uh, gram negative uh, organism also for, for gram negative also no? when when organism is not known because gram negative organisms are very virulent and they can be rapidly progressive unlike gram positive. So that is what I do. So amikacin is. Use it might be we have a uh, suspect as gram negative. Yeah, we have four gram negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tapi saya kira pilihan pilihannya in in with uh, uh, to apa ni pil amikasin. What kind do you do you use uh, if uh, we have no amikasin maybe? Uh, uh, if no amikasin, I'm uh, other like uh, gentamicin and tobramicin. Uh, which are of the same group, and if uh, gentamicin and um, um, uh, is not available, then uh, moxifloxacin is also okay because moxifloxacin can act against both gram negative and yeah, gram positive and organism. Yeah, it is yeah. broad spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So when organism is not known, not known, moxifloxacin is quite a good drug because yeah. it has broad spectrum of antibiotic, and for gram positive, it is it is even better. It yeah. is around the uh, 90 percent sensitive sensitive and for gram negative it is around 80 percent so i yeah. use uh, most processing um, uh, yeah. thank you thank you jadi memang kelihatan tidak tidak lazim kita mengasuh bahwa takutnya kita ya terjadi dalam bentuk tablet sulit kan bikin tetes kalau injeksi sih sangat mungkin jadi saya pikir masih ada alternatif lainnya atau bramisin tadi ya mau disaat juga menyebabkan atau bramisin termasuk di dan Dr. Lina, kami juga membuka kesempatan buat peserta webinar yang di luar GM untuk tanya memberikan pertanyaan via chatting via chat ya. Mungkin ada pertanyaan lagi dari peserta yang hadir di sini. Dr. Reni, silakan. Uh, thank you. I have a question uh, to Dr. Lina. Uh, first question is, uh, sometimes we have patient, we have a lot of patient with this metocell or small area of uh, thinning corneal area, but we have limited corneal donor. Do you have any suggestion? Uh, do you, you will put sclera or any other treatment? And for my second question, we are going to do subconjunctival injection avastin bepasizumab um, do you have any complication with those treatment or do you have any precautions with those treatment also thank you of uh, desmetocil or thinning um, what you can do is um, if it is uh, in the periphery if it is in the periphery near the limbus we can do conjunctival advancement and close that area okay and uh, yeah, of course, you can use clear also. Sometimes um, um, this metocil is very thin and you cannot get the cornea. Uh, we can close that um, that area with the help of sclera because sclera can be preserved for up to one year. With 95% uh, alcohol, it can be preferred preserved for one year. And for such emergency uh, conditions, you can use uh, sclera to close that um, perforation if, if you don't have cornea and for periphery in the periphery also we can use either sclera or conjunctival uh, graft advan advancement from the 
uh, from the limbus. And in that way, we can save the eyeball. And later on, when we have um, corneal transplant, when we get cornea, we can do um, uh, surgery for visual rehabilitation. Uh, yeah, we can do a uh, partial thickness, partial thickness, scleral uh, transplantation we can do because sclera will be quite thick, no? The preserved sclera will be quite thick. We can uh, just uh, dice a little bit and then um, put that. And, uh, other and my second question for, uh, about subconjunctival injection of Astin, precautions or any complication you have experienced uh, with the treatment? Yeah, theoretically, um, uh, what is say that if we use uh, uh, many doses, like many doses at the same time, no? Um, usually, I uh, my my do um, the dosing is five microgram uh, per 0.1 ml. That dose I give uh, one or two injections, uh, depending upon the at the base of the uh, root uh, base of the um, uh, root of the vessel, main vessel, no, not at the vessel, but just around the blood vessel. So uh, if you give uh, more um, in one uh, in one dose 0.1 ml but if you do more like um, 0.1 ml two three injections at the same time there is some chance of ischemia corneal ischemia and edema uh, edema so usually i give uh, one or two doses but i repeat at um, after some time after three months or four months but if you do three or four injections at the same time it, it may cause ischemia and corneal edema Okay, but, but uh, I prefer to give at interval, maybe three months time. Okay, thank you. Dr. Lina, is there any questions? Prof. Arjo. Uh, about the prevent of uh, graft rejection, uh, but using might be immunosuppression, uh, do you have uh, experience about using Sandy Moon or maybe uh, the other immunosuppression uh, medication? Because uh, in the Jakarta, many cases is caused by post infection. So I think uh, have potential of uh, rejection or inflammation. Maybe do you have experience about the uh, Immunosuppression, like maybe cyclosporin, etc. Okay. Um, in my uh, slide, I have um, there is one slide in which I have categorized coronary disease into four different categories. One with a very good prognosis, uh, very excellent prognosis, and one other there is one group fear prognosis in which uh, therapeutic coronary graph, vascularized coronary graph, repeated graph. They have uh, they have a not very good prognosis for graph survival. Those with vessels, they can reject again and again. Uh, in the same way, therapeutic coronary transplantation, they can reject again and again. So in that cases, we have to give uh, steroids for even a longer longer time. Longer time, uh, or sometimes we have to, those patients who have record, repeated graph failure, we cannot stop steroids at all. We have to give continuously lifelong, those patients with recurrent uh, graph failure. And for for keratoconus and for corneal dystrophy, pseudophagic bluesclerotopathy, usually I stop um, steroids within one uh, one year to one and a half year. I stop. But for other, and of course, we have to warn the patient that if they have any symptoms of pain, redness, uh, they have to come immediately because that can be a uh, sign of infection. Infection, no? You so, use uh, topical or systemic? I use uh, or topical. Both? Always topical, and um, if there has uh, and, and there is another one uh, possibility of uh, steroid-induced uh, glaucoma, steroid-induced glaucoma. So whenever I suspect as such, I change from prednisone acetate to uh, fluoromethylone, fluoromethylone, yes. which has which is better from the, that yes. steroid point of uh, high IOP point of view. And and when I give when I have to give uh, steroid for lifelong, I use uh, alternate day. Alternate day or uh, twice a week, twice a week or alternate day, because this low dose can uh, has um, uh, they have very less chance of 
secondary rise in IOP uh, and infection. But if you give once a day or twice a day for a long, longer time, lifelong, then there is more chance of infection. But uh, alternate day and twice a week, um, it is uh, safer, safer comparatively. So my PN might be is with uh, Rick Graf. Uh, do you use uh, my P the OT, the other immunosuppressant? If it's with Rick Graf or uh, second graph, uh, third graph. Uh, yeah, I give uh, oral uh, some oral uh, immunosuppression only at a time of uh, rejection. When patient has got rejection, uh, I give uh, steroids every uh, one hourly, every one hourly, or sometimes even half an hourly for one or two days. And if doesn't respond, then only I give oral steroid, oral steroid, and I, and I taper over three to four weeks. But um, but I don't give oral steroid for quite a long time, quite a long time. Thank you. I, I one question for Dr. Anu. Uh, I interest with Shapu. Shapu. My opinion in, in, in Indonesia is Shapu, but I uh, couldn't yet make diagnosis. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, to uh, have a um, good standard if, to make diagnosis of Shapu diabetes because sometimes we have uh, pediatric eupatis uh, and then I know the uh, pet prognosis but like uh, endophthalmitis, but like- So you have, in, uh, in you have experienced uh, such cases? Yeah, but uh, yeah. I, I so don't know what, exactly is Shapu uh, or, or no. Yeah, so um, what I found out that uh, uh, when I, I'm, you know, I've been talking with one, entomologist in Nepal, who is especially, um, you know, who, who knows about moth a lot. And he's the person who told me about the possibility of connection with this particular kind of moth. And he said that since this moth is found in many other parts of the country, uh, the disease should be present in other parts of the world as well. And uh, not surprisingly, I've uh, seen patients from India, few patients from India and one patient from Bhutan with similar features. And one patient from Bhutan was sent to me uh, to confirm the diagnosis and it was, you know, a shapu. So, I, uh, and that uh, moth is present in Indonesia also, according to what I learned from that entomologist. The, the moth is found in India, Bhutan, Indonesia. So. I would not be surprised if you had seen such case. So it is basically, uh, you know, severe panuveitis, but then you know, uh, it looks like endophthalmitis. So did you did you see the same condition in yeah. uh, that child? Yeah. So they they present with hypopion, and in the early stage, uh, the the pupil is covered by uh, the fibrin most of the time, and you're not able to see the fundus. And if you do B scan, you get very minimal vitreous changes, very yeah, minimal yeah. vitreous ecogenic shadow, yeah. and you would take it as normal. And then when the fibrin is gone with your topical treatment or subconjunctival injection of dexamethasone, you will be able to see the fundus, by, but then by that time it's too late because the whole vitreous becomes opaque and it will lead to leukocoria. And at that stage, you cannot do anything. With, even with your best medicine, the eye is uh, eye is um, you know bound to become blind and it might might become tricycle. So and this leukocoria thing, hypopion, these are all features known features of endophthalmitis. So the only thing uh, very unusual about this disease is how does streptococcus pneumoniae get inside the eye? Because you know the intact eyeball should not be getting this bacteria inside. There should be breach of continuity either in the cornea or sclera, but, but when we examine the cases, although we see a few uh, hair follicles in uh, you know 10% of cases, we don't see anything in other cases. All we have seen is some you know rough cornea that I've been seeing quite frequently. You know The cornea is very rough, but it's not like full thickness de defect. So it's very unusual for the bacteria to go inside the eye, although we know that the bacteria is the co common harbor in the conjunctival sac, and uh, of, of course in the nasal mucosa. 
So it, it, the bacteria is present around the eye, but how does it get inside the eye? So this is confusing. So if you get such cases, uh, since we know that anterior or hypopion anterior in children is very uncommon, it's, and it's not common. So if you see hypopion uveitis, then immediately you should think of endophthalmitis, be it sharp or be, be uh, it could be something else, but then endophthalmitis has to come uh, in our brain as the differential diagnosis, I should say. And then you have to tap vitreous and give intravitreal antibiotic as soon as possible. And, and you say we, we, we meet about the uh, anterior endocrine endophthalmitis. So, uh, without without uh, the story of trauma, etc. So uh, yeah. no uh, no trauma. All all they give history is about uh, contact with moth. Uh, that's all. And then uh, we have uh, we always try to uh, rule out the possibility of trauma because you know children play, uh, especially in the village area. The parents would go to farm and the children are left alone to play. Uh, play with the siblings or the um, or the friends, and they are not uh, the children, parents would not know even if they had trauma. So we try to rule out. So uh, whenever we see some, you know, uh, uh, we find some history of uh, possible trauma, then we would consider that as um, you know traumatic endophthalmitis. But then the clinical feature would be very much similar, and then we clinically also uh, if we try to rule out the a possibility of trauma. Sometimes, yes, children, uh, parents would say that my child did not sustain any trauma, but then, you know, the eye turned red and you uh, scrutinize the cornea, then you will see, uh, you know, a small, uh, it could be a small pinpoint um, lesion, but then you can make out that children had been playing with the needle and then the cornea, the eyeball was poked by the needle. So in such condition, we level it as uh, traumatic endophthalmitis. But if there is no history of uh, trauma and there's no evidence of trauma, then we label it as endogenous endophthalmitis or SHAPU. And then uh, the SHAPU has another peculiarity that is it is more common in one particular season. That's why it was termed seasonal hyperacute pan -upiitis. So it's common in the autumn season. It starts uh, um, mid-August and the peak is in the September. Almost uh, more than 50% case will come in September. Mm. Uh, and then it's not uh, every year, it's every other year, the outbreak is uh, very, very strong. And um, in the year in between, there might be very few cases. So this is unusual. Uh, although we have seen such uh, similar kind of cases throughout the year also. So we call it sporadic cases, but an outbreak would be in uh, every alternate year in autumn. So this year is uh, supposed to be the uh, outbreak year. So we are anticipating cases which uh, will start from mid-August this year. Okay, thank you. Maybe the last question. Uh, sometimes we have case with peaky it's pocoy anarchy and narratidum. But uh, the patient is uh, have maybe a problem in gastrointestinal. So we cannot accept it with a uh, steroid. So what kind of uh, mitigation for for, for PKH? For, yeah. um, if you are not able to treat with steroid oral is the question. Um, yes, uh, we, uh, uh, we are treating with available immunosuppressives. The available immunosuppressives in Nepal is methotrexate as a theoprine. And uh, we have these days uh, mycophenolic morphotil as well. Uh, cyclosporin is there, but then it's quite costly. Mycophenolic morphotil is also costly. So um, in our clinic, we try to use my, uh, this methotrexate and azathioprine as um, frequently as possible whenever needed. Uh, methotrexate is also good. We have uh, we have been able to treat uh, one time every week. Every week, yes. Every week we give like. Um, according to body weight, we can start uh, with 10 milligram per kg. Um, no, 10 milligram. And then, you know, if the, it is not showing enough response, then you can go up to 15 milligram per week. And as a therapy, also good. It is, uh, and then of course, you have to monitor all the, you know, CBC and then liver function test has to be done very frequently to make sure that a patient does not develop hepat 
hepatitis or you know bone marrow suppression um methotrexate has shown a promising result in bkh safer between uh, methotrexate with compare with cyclosporine because actually cyclosporine is covered by bkh what's that uh, uh, insurance cyclosporine is oh uh, okay yeah i don't have uh, experience with cyclosporine because it's a very um, expensive drug in nepal only the renal transplant post renal transplant patients uh, are taking that and that also in their uh, from their own expense and for uveitis patients there's no such um, you know insurance coverage so uh, I, there's no point giving because you are sure that patient will be uh, you know lost to follow up they won't not come because they don't have money for buying medicine so what i try is methotrexate and azathioprine and now these days uh, the biologics are also available but with difficulty patients uh, they themselves have to get from the from india or there's one institute uh, rheumatology institute where the drug is made available but it's very very expensive so i don't have much experience with that but methotrexate as a therapy is good and uh, sometimes in um, you know uh, dire condition where these two drugs are not uh, doing any good then um, i am compelled to give cyclophosphamide and it is very uh, i mean tricky you have to be very very cautious about the side effects very very toxic and uh, with uh, and it is a good drug if you can you know convince the patient about the condition the um, test he has to undergo frequently and then you, if you can monitor well then it uh, really does good on bkh uh, bichet's disease so you can also use that thank you thank you dr jo thank you uh, dr anu and katrina kami masih membuka kesempatan buat peserta webinar yang akan melakukan tanya jawab belum ada ya oh ya mungkin bisa langsung via chat ah, mungkin ada pertanyaan lagi dari peserta yang hadir di sini presiden atau dokter muda boleh tanya mumpung ada ahli ahlinya Yes, thank you, Dr. Prof. Harjo, uh, Dr. Lina, Dr. Anu. Uh, I have experience uh, with two children. Once one is 10 years old and one is three years old. Uh, for the case for the 10 years old patient, uh, came to our clinic with already treated in other city for one month and uh, he came with uh, hepopion if it is anterior and from the ultrasound examination there is uh, exudative uh, retinal detachment and then at that time uh, we treat him with along with the retinal specialist and uh, we did injection, intravitreal injection with Vagomox and Tramcinolone acetonide and after two injection uh, from hand movement or light perception, the Shalakiti become 2 per 60 and, and he now came after three months and still stable but one case Right now, a new case or three years old, uh, a girl came with leukocoria already cataract, hepopion, and the same ultrasound appearance with exudative ablation and uh, mild AZ vitreous. And we did also intravitreal injection with Vicomoc and 
the transonolon uh, subconjunctively because at the time the intracolor pressure is high but stable for three days the exudative uh, the serous behind the retina is gone but after one week control uh, the condition uh, is active again so as you mentioned and I, I, I read in the AO that uh, I could uh, penophytes in children we should do the vitrectomy surgery uh, it should be done in three days before three days but now it's maybe on uh, already two weeks but we plan to do the the surgery uh, next week because of the yeah the system and extra but yes like uh, what prof Herja have asked then how how can we sure we we'll make sure about the diagnosis but because maybe maybe the etiology as you mentioned before that it is maybe 40 or until 70 percent is idiopathic but the, the treatment is the same or do we need to do something other than vitrectomy and giving the antibiotic and steroid yeah. thank you thank you for the question so what i understood is the one case was uh, is almost two months now since it started another one is two weeks and both presented with hypopion and yes. hypopion and then it looked like panubiitis although yes. you could you not see the yeah. fundus well because of the vitreous haze and the the one uh, three year old or the leukocoria was from co the cataract or the vitreous opacification can you already cataract cataract already cataract when she came to our clinic after after i think about three days of three days red of, eye you're very sure that it's cataract because uh, with three days of red eye the development of cataract would be very unusual unless the patient has been child has been recurrent inflammation so uh, it's sometimes very difficult to uh, differentiate between uh, the leukocoria from cataract and uh, leukocoria from the vitreous opacification because due to inflammation the pupil would be very small and you know examination is difficult so first you have to be sure that is cataract or it is not cataract if it is not cataract it's usually the uh, white reflex from the uh, uh, opacification of the vitreous because in severe infection the vitreous becomes white as we know even in post-operative endophthalmitis cases you get leukocodia because of the uh, severe opacification of the vitreous now what i would suggest in this kind of case or any other case which is idiopathic because we saw in the slide that most of the cases are idiopathic so you don't have to panic even if it is you know most of the cases are uh, without uh, you know definitive diagnosis at least you have working diagnosis right at least you know it's antiuveitis you know it's post uveitis or it's pan uveitis so uh, you know utilizing whatever you know you can do a lot so with uveitis uh, it's the the key thing is not about knowing the underlying cause okay the key thing is first to treat the symptom treat the symptom that means treat if you see, uh, you know, hypopion anti uveitis, you would definitely not uh, first try to find out the cause, but then you would give cycloplegic, you would give topical steroid as frequently as possible, and then only you will think about the underlying cause. Because uh, to start steroid and cycloplegic, you don't have to think about the underlying cause. It can be given in any condition, be it infectious or be, be it non-infectious. So main thing is that. Another thing is you have to, you know counsel the from the very first day you have to counsel the patient or the guardian about the severity of the condition about the natural course of the uh, disease about the you know uh, gravity of uh, the condition and then uh, the counseling is very important because it's not like conjunctivitis you know you treat with one one week of uh, medication and it's gone it might recur it might uh, become chronic uh, you know it might affect the vision that counseling is very important otherwise there won't be uh, you know compliance of the patient 
they will not believe you and they will go, go from one center to another. So you have to, uh, you know, tell the patient about or patient or the guardian about the severity of the condition. And then another thing, only uh, lastly, uh, we you start the treatment and then you uh, now try to find out the underlying cause. Okay, for that you do several tests even before sending tests. History is very very important. You can't send the patient for test without history. If you see a patient, you know, stooping down, not able to put chin on the slit lamp, then you already have diagnosis and the patient has hypopion anterior So what is the diagnosis, residents? Patient stooping down, a young patient in, uh, in his 30 or 4, 30, 30, 35 years, I would say, not able to put the chin on the slit lamp and patient came with acute onset of unilateral hypopion entry uveitis. So what is the diagnosis? Anybody can guess? A sand closing spondylitis affecting the here and back. The, do you have to send any test? Not at all. The diagnosis is in front of you. So you have to look at the patient's appearance. You have to look at the, uh, you have to, you know, take history. That's important. Now, again, coming back to that thing, you have hypopion, you have, uh, um, uh, you know, inflammation everywhere. What I would suggest is, even if you don't know the diagnosis, uh, first you put the you know, differential, hypopion, around hypopion. So hypopion can be present in and closing spondylitis-related disease, actually B27. It could be pres present in herpetic infection. Uh, it could be present... Uh, in uh, very uh, uh, rarely, few, few reports have been there on tuberculosis also, although it's not very common. Uh, so, and Bichette's, okay? Bichette's is very common. I mean, hypopion is very much associated with um, Bichette's, Bichette's and hypopion. Now, uh, could it be Bichette's in that child? Because Bichette's is seen in children also. Again, it, it could be bilateral. Usually it's bilateral, so that condition was unilateral. Maybe it's not Bichette, and Bichette's, they can present with um, acute onset, and usually they have cold hypopion. That means eye is not that red or painful. Again, you, can, you try to rule that out or rule that in accordingly. And if you don't have any clue, then endophthalmitis has to come into your mind. Okay, I would suggest you know, vitreous tapping in such cases without thinking of anything else, you have to tap vitreous. If the vitreous tap is dry, you tap aqueous or you can tap both simultaneously. And they give intravitreal antibiotic without steroid because you still don't know whether it's infection or not infection. So you would want to first take care of infection. And secondarily, you might give a antibiotic on steroid also if you see some clinical response. So uh, we always do the same. We always consider endophthalmitis as one of the potent possible condition. And then tap vitreous, aqueous, give intravitreal antibiotics, send the tap for um, gram staining, KOH, and culture sensitivity all, and then we wait for report. And the clinical uh, you know, response is very important. Even if you uh, find no bacteria, no fungus, then if, but still if you find the clinical improvement, then you can be sure that's this culture negative endophthalmitis. So I would suggest that. And you, you start the uh, topical steroid and topical uh, cycloplegic right away. Don't wait for that, okay? And then antibiotic, topical, well, you can start. There's no harm, okay? If you think in terms of infection, you start antibiotic topical also, like you can uh, start a uh, broad spectrum one, moxifloxacin, and then, uh, you plan for this vitre, vitreous tap and uh, aqueous tap immediately, as soon as possible. Don't wait for that because if it is infection, the, if you treat the patient after two weeks, your treatment is not going to, even if it's the correct treatment, it's not going to um, give any result. So uh, try to uh, arrange for um, that as soon as possible for that. Uh, from, the, uh, from the time you examine the patient, you uh, plan for I you know GA surgery because you can't do without GA. So for general anesthesia, you have to keep the patient NPO, no, you know, no food for at least six, no food and drink for at least six hours. So you plan like that. 
And after the, doing that, uh, if you if the condition is not improving, then only you think of other conditions like uh, other non-infectious conditions, and then you can give oral steroid or the immunosuppressive. But hypopion uveitis has to be, you know, mm, has to be considered as infection. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lina. Yes, and Dr. Anu, Dr. Lina. Uh, waktu sudah menunjukkan 10, kurang 10. Mungkin ada pertanyaan singkat terakhir uh, dari peserta. Mumpung ada ahlinya ahli. Karena memang di Nepal itu kasus sangat banyak sekali, e, jadi beliau-beliau ini sangat expert untuk menghadapi beberapa karakteristik dan jenis penyakit. Jadi memang sehari bisa 500 sampai 700 pasien rawat jalan ya di sana. Mumpung beliau di sini, ada yang ditanyakan lagi terakhir. Mungkin kalau tidak ada, kita cukupkan. Uh, it's about the time. Uh, it's already almost 10 a.m. Uh, very thank, thank you, many thank you for uh, Dr. Lina and Dr. Anu for sharing your knowledge and experience. It's very important to us because uh, in uh, Tilganga TIO, there is uh, many much cases and it's automatically the case is very uh, many and so it's very different from here. Uh, maybe we the cases in uh, Yogyakarta is not as much in TIO. So uh, maybe you are more experienced and more get knowledge from us. Thank you for your settings and give applause to uh, before we stop this webinar uh, we will give a souvenir to the guest speaker Pak, masih 